Holiday Inn in, um, in Des Moines, Iowa, but I'm glad it wasn't. Uh, um, I, I, I'm glad that Carrie talked about phage because I got the impression this is uh, the, sort of the affirmative action in the end of talks that we're going to talk about bacteriophage. And I think uh, I'll try and convince you why it is really so important to really consider phage. Um, I, I ha we, we, I, we specify Google Hangouts because Google Hangouts have been very important to our collaborations. It's made everything made collaborations really quite wonderful. And uh, we can't share coffee yet, but maybe soon we're going to get a beaming down technology. The, this motivation for this is really these two undergraduates. Uh, well, oops. Yeah. The, the first, uh, this is. Um, uh, Nilong Shaw and, and Wakas Chowdhury. Nilong is an Emory undergraduate. Wakas is a um, graduate student from Islamabad who did his research in my lab. And Marish Pleska is from the IST in, in Vienna. Uh, Ingrid McCall is our lab manager, amazing, amazing lab manager. Howie Weiss is our, our resident mathematician. It was sort of an affirmative action thing. You want to have one around, but you don't. And Jim Bull is my good friend. Uh, and there's two pictures of Jim Bull, one eating breakfast, which he, and the other one was a couple months ago at the National Academy. Um, and so they, uh, the work is about that. Well, you'll see what I'm, anyway. So the quest outline, we're going to give you a perspective on phage, although Carrie began to start that. <clears throat> We're going to continue to consider lytic phase, the phase that are sometimes referred to as virulent, and I'm going to present a, a hypothesis about how they're maintained in bacterial populations. And I'm going to talk about temperate bacteriophage. I'll, I'll give a little bit more background. Uh, that is the ones that form lysogens and are, and are vertically transmitted. And then I'm going to consider the two of them together. Uh, and these are pictures of phage uh, and eating bacteria and doing nasty things. Um, the, uh, some, I love this, this, this kind of phrase that is bacteriophage are the most abundant organisms on Earth. And then they give these numbers like 10 to the 30 bacteria, 10 to the 31 phage, whether it's 2.39 times 10 to the 30, I don't know. But the, the phage talks start with this, sort of like antibiotic talks start out with antibiotic resistance is the worst thing ever. This was before the election in, 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 in the United States but in November, but I won't start my antibiotic talk. It's a great career opportunity. But phage is certainly abundant, whether it's 10 to the 31 or not, I don't know, but they are all over the place. You know, you can go. We're going, to, we're going to go snorkeling later. What my people going snorkeling don't realize, I'm there to get some phage and find some in, 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 in the Adriatic. But they're, they're really abundant. Uh, but we really know shit about them. Shit is a, a technical term for those of us that work with E. coli. We really know nothing about what they do in natural populations. Very, very little. The first phage that's to be discovered was by a guy by the name of Hankin in 1896. And he, something, there was something in the Yuma and Ganges River that, that, that lice, vibrio, cholerae, in vitro. And there was the first evidence for phage. Whether they're regulating the densities of populations. So we really don't know what they're doing. And that, that's really kind of curious. In, in, in that, do the phage actually regulate the densities of the bacterial populations? Do they uh, contribute to the species and, and strain distribution? What do they contribute to the diversity? There was all of this discussion at most of this talk was considering diversity, but really didn't consider the role of phage. And they're, they're out there all the time. What are the contributions to phage to horizontal gene transfer? I mean, we know we could get transduction all the time. What about the con what are the conditions under which phage will be maintained in bacterial populations? What are their what I'm going to call their existence conditions? <clears throat> under what conditions will temperate and lytic modes of phage replication be maintained? Uh, these are the kinds of questions that I'm going to be talking about. The last two is, is going to be the main focus of of what I'm going to be talking about. 
And we also have been doing phage therapy. <laughs> the question, these are phage come from, that came from, if you need phage, I have, they came from Tbilisi, Georgia. There was a Insta, phage institute in Tbilisi, still is. And at one time, Russia, the whole former Soviet Union, phage were a dominant mechanism for, for treating and preventing infection. Did it work? Did it not work? And, uh, and it was this year, well, I don't have time to talk, we, we met a number of people who've been getting phage therapy and, and are very much, um, uh, and one of them went to Tbilisi and brought us back all these phage. I've been there, I also got phage, and some of the phage we're using for our experiments are coming from this. Uh, we recently published a paper, I'm sorry, about using phage to break up biofilms for the, the joint action of antibiotics in phage. The antibiotic resistance has gotten people panicked, and phage, there's a resurgence of phage. <laughs> and I think it's sort of interesting to look at how you could break up biofilms using anything to break up biofilms for joint treatment with antibiotics. It's not what I'm going to talk about now. Uh, what I, hmm. This is Frank Stewart. Frank Stewart is a mathematician I work with. Uh, for many, many years um, at Brown, I starting when I was an assistant professor at Brown, wonderful, wonderful human being and, and mathematician. And so there's a lot of what I might call deja vu in this talk, but there was a lot of deja vu in this whole meeting, that is, these questions that, that we were asking. And Alan Campbell, who has played a major role in uh, understanding uh, how lambda works and, and lysogeny, wrote a paper in 1961 entitled Conditions for the Existence of Bacteriophage. How do bacteriophage maintain their populations in the presence of bacteria? Now, there was, a, there was something that came out of this, this, this paper here with Frank, the one, oh, that's not what I wanted to do, that, that this one where we, we took about, we're interested in, conditions, resource partitioning, and the conditions for maintaining populations. And one of the things that came out of it was that if, in fact, the number of, say, bacteria N, it has to be greater than the number of phage, and the, and the number, uh, and, and the, but less than uh, the number of phage plus resources, meaning we can theoretically, by putting phage into these communities, we can totally pack the communities, at least in theory. So therefore, I was really surprised that all the talks this, that we had about bio, that the structure of communities and, you know, and microbiomes, which is another career opportunity, people are not looking at, at the role of phage. I mean, I, I'm not, I don't know what that role is, but it seems to me something should be looking at it. That is, if the, num the number of, say, prey has to be greater the than of prey, prey species. Prey species, yeah. yeah. Not, not the biomass or anything like that. No, 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 number of species or number of genotypes, they're number of clones. Has to be less than the number. So you add, you add a third trophic level, you can totally expand the diversity, at least in theory. Whether it's done in reality, I don't know. So for this purpose, uh, I'm thinking strains, clones. I mean, if you take E. coli, there's more diversity in E. coli than, than in, in all the mammals. So uh, it, I don't want to get into the philosophical of what is a species, uh, in, in, because that's a philosophical and, and semantic question. But there's tremendous amount of diversity in, in these organisms. So how do you maintain all that so diversity? What? Right, that, that would be, prob that's one practical definition. Whether it's species in the same way, they, you know, who mates with who and who could produce fertile offspring, they, you know, they, they, they don't do that at all. Right, yeah. <laughs> I don't want to embarrass you about you know, that sex stuff. Um, anyways, this is, is the life cycle of lytic phage. Basically, uh, the sort of the, the standard lytic phage. Some don't kill their cells, some just ooze out but they're, they're growing at the expense of the, of the bacteria. So the bacteria and phage in, enter the cells. They then basically turn the bacteria into a machine to produce more phage and the bacterial lice 
in the simple interpretation. And we're, so we're infecting the cells, and we're producing, say, 50 or 100 phage particles for every infection. And that's the, the concept of a lytic phage. That's the classical phage, T2, T7, and, and so on. This is, and then there's another class of phage, which are called temperate. Temperate phage, have the, they, they do the lytic cycle, so they replicate that way. But there's a low probability that when they infect a cell, they will incorporate their genome into that of the cell. And if they incorporate their genome into that of, whoops, shit, that's not what I wanted to do. Uh, there's a light here. Uh, OK. If they incorporate their genome into the cell, then they have the possibility of being transmitted vertically. So they have the virtue of being transmitted horizontally, entering a population, and then they can be transmitted vertically and, and, and then be transmitted in the course of cell division. Now, phage, we, you know, in addition to killing bacteria, they're code for many, many characters in terms of the, the, the prophage. So Staphylococcus, for example, has oodles of these prophage, these, these latent phage. But if you look at it, you know, the bacteria would be quite nice. So, so the first one was, was uh, Bordetella. I mean, uh, 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 diphtheria, Cornobacterium diphtheriae. The, the Cornobacterium diphtheriae is avirulent unless it has a prophage. So the virulence is coded for by a prophage. Cholera is avirulent. The toxin is coded for by a prophage. Why are all these toxins coded for by phage rather than chromosomal genes? Why not plasmids? So that many of these toxins are coded for by phage. 0157, E. coli, that gives you the hemolytic uremic syndrome, the phage code for the toxins. Not, so, the, so we've got nice bacteria and these the sort of nasty phage. Temperate phage have uh, certain virtues. I mean, they, they can be transmitted infectiously, uh, and they can become established and maintained at any density once the, because so they don't have a lower density as you would for, for uh, horizontally transmitted, and they can directly increase the fitness. So why aren't all phage temperate? Why are some phage obligatory lytic? I mean, and part of the answer, and maybe this would have, I use the word cheating, is we could get mutants of temperate phage that are lytic. That is, a temperate phage, when, when a cell is in, gets a prophage, it's immune to superinfection with that phage. So that once it gets the prophage, it now won't be infected by that phage. It's basically resistant to that phage. Immune is more accurate. But we can get mutants that will be cheaters in that sense, in the, that they can then replicate on the, the ones with the prophage. So the big issue that we had, uh, and starting in, in a paper written ages and ages ago, is you know, why be temperate? That is, if in fact you can have these, these lytic mutants can occur. Well, it was a paper we wrote a long time ago, and I was, uh, at the time, we were interested in this question of existence conditions. And then I got in a little bit fickle, I got onto other subjects. And it wasn't until these two grad this undergraduate and graduate student came, I said, well, let's go back to this question. So we wrote just a theoretical paper. Writing a theoretical paper is kind of not, not as satisfying. You know, it's, maybe it's like masturbation. It's not quite the same thing in that is getting into doing the experiments. And, that, and you know, the experiments are really what I'm, I'm into. I love modeling, but it's not the same. And you really want to do the experiments or have somebody do the experiments for you. No, no. <laughs> so that's what it's. So that the, the issue that, that I'm going to first address is that while phage are, are, are maintained in, when you do an experiment with phage, you do infect with a population of bacteria and phage and chemostats or serial passage, what happens is that they're maintained continuously. And temperate phage clearly exists. So that is to say, so we're not going to refer to them as problems. One, my hero, Andre Levovsk, one of his comments is, nature does not have problems. Nature only has solutions. So obviously, 
we're not going to say, I'm not going to conclude from based on the models that phage couldn't exist. Or if I, I did, and, and, and even if I had some theorems and lemmas and stuff like that, we'd have to deal with the fact that they do exist. So the, the, the questions I'm raising, what we see when we do experiments, and these are experiments going back a long, long time before many people here were diploid, but, but basically, when you take, this is a phage a T7, the one that, that you work with, and, and, and a wonderful student, my first student, Lin Chow, and you could see that, that in, in this situation, we, have, we start out with sensitive uh, bacteria, we then have phage, we then get mutant bacteria that are resistant to the phage, and then we get phage that can attack those bacteria, and then we get bacteria that are resistant that can take over, and you can see it in this case, this is a chemostat that went 1,200 hours with the phage being maintained at a dominant population with phage, and the bacteria were maintained at this low level. Not low, in the 10 to the 6 or so. But once you get resistant mutants, the, the resistant mutants take over, and the bacteria and phage continue to coexist. So the, now the dominant population of bacteria is resistant to the phage. And this occurs in, in this is E. coli T2. We get the same thing. Within a short order, the dominant population of bacteria is resistant to the phage. This is studies with cholera, Vibrio cholerae. We're interested in the role of phage in, in regulating the densities of cholera. So we weren't interested, we weren't interested in the dynamics of phage as much, but rather the practical applications. And there, too, the phage resistance evolves, but the phage continue to be maintained. Uh, the, this is Pseudomonas. Uh, in this case, there's a whole bunch of cultures. Wacos uh, did these experiments. Uh, we have, uh, and in most of the cases, the dominant population of ba bacteria are resistant. And, and, and this, this is sort of what you see. And nevertheless, in most cultures, the phage are maintained. So the phage theoretically can't be growing on these resistant bacteria. And nevertheless, their populations are maintained. This was serial transfer. The others were chemostats. So it doesn't matter. And we're now doing it in, 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 in film, biofilms, and we're still getting the maintenance of phage. This one here is Streptococcus thermophilus. It, it's a whole other seminar. We're, when, when people discovered, you know, that cri, cri, people, actually Rudolf Barangiu uh, sh showed that, you know, that CRISPR, this is sort of a, there's a whole enterprise now. You probably think of CRISPR-Cas as, as a tool of capitalist molecular biologists, where now it's a major thing in terms of genome en editing now. And, and there's a lot of concern about, you know, changing humans with this system. Well, this, this CRISPR-Cas is, a, is an adaptive immune system in bacteria. And we, we did these experiments trying to explain how you maintain this, this situation where you're getting a continuous coevolution occurring. And in, in this particular bacteria, which we got from Rudolph, it grows, it, 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 it is the one that produces yogurt. It's Streptococcus thermophilus. And so that's why we were growing it in milk. It's the ideal medium for it. And you just go get some, we, we gave them skim milk. We didn't want them to get too fat. But you, know, you could grow them in milk. And uh, the only problem is that you're ultimately sampling yogurt. So that you put them in your milk in one day, and the next day you got yogurt. So you have to then, to estimate the densities, you got to really vortex them. And pretty amazing to me how rapidly yogurt is formed by this, this phage. And there was a lot of interest in it from a practical perspective of um, that phage contamination is a major problem in the dairy industry. That is, you know, you have 20,000 20, liters of milk and you're going to make some cheese or, or, and then you get phage contamination. And so it doesn't prevent it, but it puts it off by many, many hours, and therefore it was economic. So there's a lot of interest in and Rudolf Berenger, a really terrific scientist, was in fact working with um, a, a company called Dinasco, which made starters for yogurt. So there's a lot of interest in phage from the very practical perspective. 
once again, you're maintaining this population of phage dominated by bacteria that are resistant or immune, actually immune in this case. So how are the bacteria, how are the phage being maintained? So that's the question I want to first address, is how they can be maintained if they can't replicate on, on, on the... Okay, so that's the first question. We can't say they can't be maintained because we obviously maintain them. Well, we do modeling as well as experiments, and uh, we use, and I, on our website, I say we doing population biology and evolutionary biology without mathematical or computer simulation models is like playing tennis without a net or boundary lines. I mean, that, that's actually stolen from Robert Frost about poetry without rhyme. But you really need to do it. I mean, as Chris saw it, had to do it. And of course, each, so in this case, so we have virulent phage, lytic phage, and, and called V, and we have sensitive cells, and we're assuming that we're producing resistant mutants at some rate. And then, so that, that it, then you could turn it into a series of differential equations, which you can hum. There's a wonderful comment by, in, a, in, a, in a book review by Medawar when he says to a friend, when you see, a, a theoretical paper with equations you, you, you can't understand. How do you read the paper? His friend says, I hum the equations. I find that to be the most devastating <laughs> comment. But anyways, it's a very simple mass action model where we have, uh, we, we have uh, uh, four, uh, four bacterial populations, resistant, virulent, sensitive, and we are also assuming resources, that the, there's a resource that limits the whole thing, and we're assuming, and by using resources, we can change the physiological state so that when the resource concentration gets low, the bacteria or the phage are not replicating as rapidly. In theory, this is what we would expect with the, est so we estimate the parameters quite independently. So you could estimate the nice thing working, working with bacteria and, and phage is we can independently estimate the parameters under the conditions so that the models are constrained even when you're doing numerical analyses. And so that this is, so this is what we would expect in the course of a short amount of time. The bacteria killed off, the phage then take over. And if I do serial passage, this is if I assume there's a refuge below 10 to the 2, the bacteria can Phage, stop, phage replication stops, and we do this over, this is over tw each one of these is at time. The phage can, we can maintain, in the absence of resistance, we're going to maintain a population of bacteria uh, at a low level, and it's going to be, uh, uh, and, and the dominant population is going to be resistant. If, in fact, we use the parameters we estimate and allow for resistant, virulent, uh, uh, Resistance, the resistance take over, and, and the phage are lost. How, how are we maintaining them if, in fact, the models are predicting that? And so we did the experiments. We used, in this case, we, we used varieties of bacteria and phage. This was all done with Staphylococcus, I mean E. coli, using lambda, E. coli, uh, uh, Lambdas, I mean, this whole book's about, written about lambda. <laughs> and, uh, and curiously enough, we're running into new observations about the molecular biology of lambda, which I couldn't believe. I always thought it was all worked out. Anyways, I can mention that later. So we have E. coli, have lambda vir, a mutant lambda that can grow on lysogens. We have a lambda can, a temperate phage that has a canamycin marker so that when it infects the bacteria and we form lysogens, the lysogens are resistant to canamycin. So we could tell the ones that have acquired the prophage. And uh, we grow them in minimal maltose medium or, or, or lysogeny broth, also known as LB. And then we, and we're just doing serial transfer culture. So that's the the entire technology, uh, other than you know, plating and so on. Now, there's a certain caveat. How do you know whether bacteria is resistant or not? Well, what the best test is you take a lawn of you may a lawn. We take a soft auger and put a, put a high density of bacteria, and we drop the phage on there, 
And then uh, if, in fact, the phage don't grow, we say it's resistant. There's a caveat there is that the assay, if you have a minority population of sensitive, if you have, say, 1% sensitive, it'll look like it's resistant. OK, so that's one of the problems of how you would phenotypically uh, estimate, determine resistance. But people, this is used all the time. And, and so, but this ra raises the possibility that the population may not be totally resistant. Now, this is uh, one, one of the experiments where we take lytic phage, sensitive bacteria in this maltose medium. Maltose is, is associated with the receptor site for, for lambda. And this is over the short term. And over the long term, we're getting maintenance. That is to say, we're getting coexistence. This is a series of transfers. And so this is in the absence of phage. And these are dominated. And what happened is resistance evolved very, very rapidly. So we did many different experiments of this type. Occasionally, or some of them, the phage would be lost. In the majority of them, the phage would be maintained. This is just looking at the phage. The majority of them, independent experiments, were getting the phage maintained. And, and as I said, occasionally we're getting losses at different times. So the question we're asking is, how are the phage maintained if the dominant population can support their growth? All right? And so there's something occurring. And so there were basically four hypotheses. That is, phage resistance engenders a fitness cost. And you can show that if there's a fitness cost, you can maintain it so that if the sensitive can coexist. And I'll, I'll argue why that's not the case. There's a refuge on the walls of the flask. Two postdocs in my lab numbers of years ago. That is, we have biofilms and things like that, and phage are not getting at the, so that you know, as long as there are walls on the flask, these, when you start out with sensitive, many of the sensitive bacteria are going to end up on the walls, and they're going to continually putting in uh, sensitive bacteria. Uh, the other is resistance is not absolute, and, uh, and that there are few functional receptors, so that, that is not really an absolute thing. And the, the last one is the one I'm going to argue for. And I would say it's a new mechanism, and it is I, in, in, in some ways. But people have made this before, including Max Delbrook. Who was a sort of for, for the physicists here? He was he was the, the, the physicist that changed biology more than anybody else. He wrote a paper in 1946 saying that basically when you get mutants that are resistant, the phage continue to be maintained. He he it was something that would have been interpreted as lysogeny, but he didn't believe in lysogeny. So he goes through all this bullshit to avoid accepting the possibility that there's lysogeny. And one of the bullshits is that the phage are reverting at a high rate, the bacteria are reverting at a high rate. So we, we're, the, we're going to focus on what we call the leaky hypothesis. And the proposition that, that is if the resistant cells can, in fact, support the growth of the phage because they're producing sensitive cells, that means if we start out with a population of resistant cells, they, they, and, and there's an, a rate of transfer, reversion to sensitive, then the resistant, they're going to be maintained. To test it, we isolated 11 independent resistant mutants and, uh, and uh, put them in with the bacteria. And, uh, and in uh, eight of them, the phage were maintained. And in uh, three of them, the phage were lost. So we're starting out with only resistant cells and, uh, and lytic phage that can't grow on them. That by all the physical criteria, they would say, but if you do the experiment, you start out with resistant, we're getting as many of them can grow. All right? And so it's consistent with this leaky resistance hypothesis. That is, that it, 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 we're getting, so you start out with a culture resistant, your phage can actually grow. Two, the question is, 
at what rate does the rate of transition from sense resistant to sensitive have to occur to maintain the phage? How do you get that? So well, the way you get it, as you guys would probably appreciate, is you do a model and you ask what rate do you need? And so what the, what the model says is the rate has to be between 10 to the minus four and 10 to the minus five per cell per hour, meaning the rate of, trans, of producing cells that the phage can grow on has to be that high to get the results observed. And the question then become, how do we estimate something like that? How do we estimate? It's easy to estimate the rate of mutation to phage resistance. That's what Luria Delbrook did, which turned out to be the most single most important paper in, in, in genetics and in a way in evolution. That you know that that you could, so, could get mutations to phage resistance. You just take a bunch of phage, plate your bacteria on them, and the ones that can grow are resistant. Easy to do, and it really works. And you could estimate the rate of mutation by doing fluctuation, many different ones. Beautiful, beautiful experiment. But how do you get? How do you estimate the rate of production of sensitivity? Well, I mean, one possibility is you get lots and lots of students and we'll have them do tooth picking and, uh, and, and then look at the frequency, you know, look at 10 to the seven cells and get to see what the frequency of resistance was. Well, it's really uncool. It's, it's exploitation of students and, and, and toothpicks and so on. So, we, 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 so that, that didn't seem to be the way to do it. The way that we do it was, in fact, using lysogeny. That is to say, if, in fact, that is this temperate phage can only grow in fat cells that, so if there's a minority of resistant cells, the temperate phage can infect them and we'll see lysogens. So the prediction was that if, in fact, the temperate phage, that is, we take this population of resistant cells, and ask if temperate phage can infect them. And then from the frequency of ones that a temperate phage can form, we could estimate the frequency of, of sensitive cells in the population. We, we ordered more toothpicks, but this actually worked, so we didn't need all the toothpicks. So the, the, so the idea was very straightforward. And, and, then, and, and from the model of temperate phage, we can estimate the frequency, the rate of mutation, because we can estimate the rate of lysogen formation. So that we can not only show that we can get this, we can estimate the rate. Admittedly, we have to use models, but, you know, if you... So, the models then, if in fact, so the models make the following prediction. That is, depending on this rate of reversion, what I'm calling mu r, we would get a certain frequency of new lysogen. So we start out a population with te temperate phage and, uh, and then we're, and, and sensitive cell, and no sensitive cells, but we have a rate of reversion from the resistance. And, from, we, could, and we would then predict that we can get so many lysogens. And from the frequency of lysogens, we should be able, the number of lysogens, we should be able to estimate that rate. We are just doing those experiments now. I should have pointed out <laughs> that although, that most, almost all you've heard in terms, since we started with the lambda and the models is, is new. We're still in progress here. Um, I'm, I'm pleased to say. <laughs> and so we can get it, but the question is, there are alternative hypotheses, so we've gone through the, these alternative hypotheses, and so, hmm, I didn't want to, okay, so what we're going to argue, I, I think I put my slides in the wrong order, okay. So this should be the slide that I, that, and I'll just talk about the alternative hypotheses and how we rejected them. So, so far we only have one hypothesis that I'm considering this reversion. And if you look at this, these are 11 independent mutants. All of them can form lysogens. So they're resistant. We infect them with temperate phage. They all form lysogens, which is consistent with the idea of some of them, of their, their being sensitive. 
And so they all form lysogens, and many of them can support the phage. So basically we're saying this is consistent with the leaky hypothesis. That is to say, we don't know whether the rate is high enough, but the rate, every, that, that's what we have to figure out. And the question is, have we rejected uh, the alternative? That is to say, hypotheses are really there, there to be tested, not, not to be championed. So I gave four hypotheses. And I'm giving one hypothesis that we're, 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 we're supporting. OK, the phage resistance engenders a fitness cost. When we do the models, it takes a 35% reduction in fitness. We don't see that. I mean, they grow as well as the resistant in these cases grow as well. So that's inconsistent. What about there's a refuge on the walls? Well, there's no refuge yet because the only bacteria we're putting in are, are resistant. So that's pretty much inconsistent with that. The third possibility, resistance is not absolute. That is to say there's a low absorption rate, and that's what we're seeing. That one we can't really reject easily, but it's inconsistent so that if I have the theory and we have a very low rate of absorption, we're not going to get the observed dynamics. We're going to get the population dominated by the phage. And if the absorption rate is too low, we're going to not get, get it established. So basically, we're, we're supporting the reason, this, this mechanism. Now, this is, uh, I'll let you look at this, because we, 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 we talked about this at dinner a couple of times, OK? Evolutionary biologists, in the past, we published something up in, in American Naturalist, and it, we, when it came to the molecular mechanisms in the past, we say some bullshit in, in the discussion, and then everybody was happy. We can't get away with that anymore. That is to say, people are going to ask, OK, you're postulating a mechanism. There's all the tools of molecular biology. You can't get with, ready with that crap anymore. You're going to have to do the do it. And so this is what that's all about. In reference to <laughs> at dinner that night when we were talking, that's when I got this idea of, I call them the mechanism mafia. That is, you send you admit your paper, and they'll say, this is really good, but what's the mechanism? And we can't get away without it uh, anymore. So here's our tribute to the mechanism mafia. And I think if, <laughs> Tribute seems to be the right word, too, OK? There's a wonderful, I men mentioned Andre Leboeuf. Leboeuf was, is the one that showed lysogeny, unquestionably that there, there really is lysogeny. And in a shrift to Delbruck, he was asked to talk about his most important contribution to molecular biology. And one of the things he says is it's really important not to determine what your most important contribution is, but rather to have somebody else tell you. What? Yeah. Uh, no, no, I'm sorry. 1902. Yeah, oh, no, I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah, no, he's very young. <laughs> he was amazing in many ways. That would have been even more amazing. But the last one I love, the, uh, he says, uh, prophage is a remarkable indent, in, in, indeed, a molecule, I should say, for I have to be molecular. Who is not? And I just sort of love that, that particular phrase. And, and, and virtually everything else, even his, his, his reviews are funny and warm and, and, and interesting. So I really recommend Andre Levus writing. He was the, the major advisor of, uh, of Jacob and Minot, among other things. And pretty amazing. Anyways, actually, I met him once, but he didn't like mathematical models. But we talked anyhow. Uh, uh, <laughs> it was great. But anyway, so the question is, so basically, we ha did what we should be doing. Is So we did the sequencing. We sequenced the genes that are, are associated with lambda. And the answer uh, is that some of them where, uh, are insertions. And, and, and those insertions revert at a high rate, which accounts for why we're getting. If you looked, we could see two things occurring with the lysogens. Some of the lysogens 
that we got when we infected the resistant cells were sensitive, meaning reversion. Some were, were resistant, meaning some sort of phenotypic mechanism. So we got, we're getting both. And when we looked at the molecular data, uh, it looked like we can pretty much explain the ones that are reverting are often insertion sequences, which then are excised out at a high rate. And the ones that are phenotypically, uh, the ones that are, are, are not resistant are small T mutations, regulatory mutations, and are probably screwing up in some of the cells. So I think, I don't know whether the, the mechanism mafia will be totally <laughs> satisfied with our tribute, but I think we're at the point of saying we can pretty much explain it. The evolutionary biologists will, because they'll just skip over that part anyhow, so it does, we're fine. All right. So the conclusion that some of the mutants are real reversion, and we can explain the high rate. Some are transitioned from resistant to sensitive, phenotypic, and presumably noise, or what would refer to noise. And one of the things we work on is the phenomenon of persistence. That is, if you treat with bacteria, and this is a bacteria, this is gentamicin, this is a, 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 a oxacillin, and, and well, oxacillin is not so good. This is Staph aureus. That is, you don't just kill everybody, you get some survivors. Those survivors are what are called persisters, and, uh, and those persisters, uh, it's a whole industry, in, 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 and people have lots of hypotheses about the mechanisms of persistence. Uh, and, 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 and Chris was talking about it earlier. It's really phenotypic. That is, if I take these ones that survive, I could repeat the experiment and get the same rates. And uh, we gave this in a paper where I, we, with, uh, uh, we have this thing, persistence. Uh, I wanted to use uh, the word copacetic, which is, is a jazz term for satisfactory hypothesis for persistence. And we're just saying it shit happens. That is, it's like mutation. It's an, it's an error. It's an error in, in not, and, and although it, not inconsistent. So we have this, we get at the mechanism of phenotypic. Now, temperate phage alone, how, if, whether, under what conditions will temperate phage alone be maintained? To adjust, to adjust that, we did the modeling routine where we have temperate phage and the likelihood, and we could estimate the parameters of the model, and here's the model. And if we look at, uh, forget the model, you're welcome to it, and, and so on. Uh, that is, if we look at what we would expect from the, 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 the theory. The theory, if in fact, so we have, in this case, we're, we have a population of sensitive cells infected with temperate phage. The phage density goes all the way up, and uh, lysogens are formed. When we do the experiments, so I, I, I put dots on there. We always have this trouble of telling the theory from the experiments. We're so good that you know. <laughs> You can see it doesn't quite fit, but basically, the, within short order, the dominant population is, uh, is um, the phage go up, and, and this, is, this is the short term. If I look at the long term, we, we're getting new lysogens. We can't find the sensitive cells anymore, and, and, and the, there's some low density of phage, but the phage sweep through and then are tra vertically transmitted. And if we start with lysogens, uh, that is, instead of starting with uh, free phage, we start with lysogens, which uh, have a rate of induction. The model doesn't fit as well for both cases. And, and so the model doesn't fit, which means we, and I think models are, are in a way best when they don't fit. That means you miss something big about the biology, and therefore you have, uh, so we haven't figured it all out, but basically lysogens are maintained and, and, and so that either way, whether you start with free phage or you start with cells invading a population that, were already, that are already temperate, it goes through. Now to the question that, that was in a way motivated everything. So under broad conditions, if you infect the population uh, with 
temperate phage. The phage are going to form prophage of uh, lysogens, and it's going to be maintained, and you're going to see some minority population of sensitive, uh, of free phage. Pretty, pretty close to what we're anticipating. But the question is, what about temperate and lytic phage together? Will the cheaters take over? By the cheaters, in this case, I mean the, the, the virulent mutants that can attack the lysogens. And there are so many possibilities. The temperate phage exclude the lytic. That's one possibility. That they phage. Another possibility, the, the lytic excludes the temperate, which is what we were concerned about. That is, that's going to sweep through the population and kill all, and then it's going to turn them into just tools. And then there, there's equity. And so the question then became what, what happened? And so we have the extended model, which accounts for all of the other observations. And that, too, turns into a series of equations. And the theory is predicting, first of all, if we have a certain rate of reversion from resistant to sensitive in the range observed, we're going to maintain, we're going to have resistance. This is resistant. Uh, to virulent, so we have virulent and temperate phage together. We're going to have resistant lysogens. We're going to have phage, and the virulent phage, the free virulent phage, are going to be lost, and, and, and the lysogens are going to take over. If we have a higher rate of reversion, then everybody's maintained in, in a stable way. That's the prediction. From, from the very simple mass action model, which doesn't account for structure and things like that. This is what happens when they're together. That is to say, so the dominant population is the total cells. They're, when we, we examine them, they're largely resistant to the lytic phage. We're getting resistant lysogens, and the temperate phage are maintained. So that, in, so that we're, we're basically the theory is predicting stable coexistence, and we're observing coexistence, not necessarily numerically identical. Now, as I mentioned, that one of the advantages of lysogeny is that if there's selection for the genes on the prophage, then we're going to maintain it anyhow. So that if we're selecting for the ones carrying the prophage. And that was really easy to do in our experiments because we had the canamycin resistance marker. So we have a canamycin resistance marker. We just put canamycin in there. And you could see when we do put canamycin in there, we're putting about um, two times MIC of uh, minimum inhibitory concentration. The, the, the lysogens just take over. So, we're saying, and I'm sure the temperate phage in the world are pleased to know that they're not going to be taken over by lytic viruses. So that it, it, it is the, the theory and the experiments are saying, with the parameters in the range, that they can coexist. And that's what we see. So in accord to our models, they, they will coexist. And equity prevails, which is nice to, I can't, I can't, we can't extend it beyond our flasks, unfortunately. So at least in computer simulations and laboratory culture, we can have equity prevailing. That's where we are. The, the work you've seen has not yet been published. We're just getting it together now. It's just too much fun. And it's sort of a whole new generation in, in our lab interested in these questions of existence conditions. I certainly hope that some of the physicists here are looking for really interesting biology will turn in the direction of phage. As I said, you know, you start out the world's most abundant organisms. What can be a better opening line for a, for, for a paper? And there are tremendous questions that are not known, and particularly for field ecologists to get out there and actually ask in, in the Adriatic, where in, in the ocean, open ocean you get 10 to the 6 phage per mil on, on average. So they don't, don't, you know, you got, if you take a shower, you'll be fine. Um, how are those phage maintained? You know, obviously, they're growing on the bacteria there. Are they limiting the density of bacteria? What is, their, what is their role? I mean, I think these are really delicious questions that we haven't answered. 
And if we're interested in, you know, now we throw the microbiome, what is it doing with respect to the microbiome? What are these phage doing? Are they having any effect on this? You know, you see, you know, the, you know when microbiome goes, gets away from molecular sociology, then people will start asking these kinds of questions. And, and what was really nice about this meeting is it was getting away from molecular sociology of who lives with who. But then there's all these mechanistic questions. And what are the phage doing in this? And I hope people are adequately interested. Thank you.